Um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm wrecked. Ready? Worship the yeah, the worship this morning wrecked me, man. I'm like caught up in the heavenly realms. I'm ready to get it on. So you know what? If I get a little boisterous, if I jump in the front while well, no one's in there to catch me today, um, I'm going to be on it. I didn't come in feeling that way. Actually, I came in broken. But you know what? God's above that. And His promises are sure. And I just feel like His presence is going to be released even more so today. So, I know we've been talking about the last two weeks about God's wrath. But good news isn't really good news unless it's compared with the alternative. And as we looked and studied, the alternative to those who have salvation is those who don't. And those who don't have the, don't have the same promises. And those who do have this justice in their lives that God says that He will finally crush sin underneath the feet of Jesus and He will do away with it for all eternity. I need a finality to that. Because I see the injustice of this world and I struggle with that. And I go, where are you, God? But His declaration in His wrath says that He's going to deal with it. Then we looked in Matthew 7 and Matthew 25 and we talked about how the wrath of God lines with the, uh, up with us personally. And that if we're not doing the active work of God, then we need, have, we need to evaluate our own lives and say, are we in faith? Because there's many in that statement. It says, many will come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, and they have a false profession. And I don't want people living, leaving this building thinking they have something and when in fact they don't. And you know he's speaking to that? In that? He's speaking to the church. We like to point at cults and other religions and say they're doomed without Jesus. But I want to tell you, I want to speak to some people in the church saying that you're doomed without Jesus. This stuff is not just for them, it's for us. And we've got to evaluate our lives with those statements. We can't just think that the, that the freedom we have was just for us to squander it. It's valuable. And so today, we're going to talk about freedom in light of that. We're going to talk about God's grace in light of that. So turn with me to Romans chapter 8. A little bit, bit of background to Romans. Paul wrote Romans uh, to set in order the church. Romans is really, uh, is really one of the most profound books ever written. And in the book of Romans, Paul confines all under sin. And not only that, we're all under God's judgment. And not only that, he says that even if we have salvation, shall we continue in sin? And the answer is certainly not. And then Paul highlights all this garbage in Romans 3, especially 3 through 7, that we're all under sin, we can't fix ourselves, and then Romans 8 takes place, and he ties all it in to living in the Spirit. Jesus Christ came to save us, and that salvation doesn't come by fixing ourselves. It doesn't come by getting everything right. It comes by receiving it and living a new life. See, the new life declares new promises. And so, while we're turning to Romans, and I need to be quiet so I can actually find the passage. Don't you know I'm a talker? Well, it's after, it's before Genesis and after Revelation. All right, Romans 8. We're going to read through verse 23. Ready? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free, what? Free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. Come on now. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. 
So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the, bondage, the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, watch this, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. This is my favorite, this next verse is my favorite passage to read at funerals. Ready? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectations of the creation eagerly waits for the revelation of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willing, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of, the, of corruption into glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. What a glorious passage this is. Because it declares freedom, freedom to live in the Spirit. Our memory verse for today, 2 Corinthians 3.17. It says, Now where the Spirit of the Lord is, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There's freedom in some of your translations. There's liberty. There's freedom. What's the Spirit of God do? It makes me free from the bondage of the law and death. Let me, uh, let me give you a question. Can you be free if you're not in the Spirit? No. No, you'll be completely in bondage. So the first principle has to do with this. Ready? Uh-oh. I hit something. Something's wrong. Oh, there it is. Try again. Okay, there we go. All right. Here's the truth. We will always have a ruler over us. Every single one of us. The lie from the enemy says that we're free to ourselves. We'd like to think so. We think freedom's all about us, huh? If I'm free from financial difficulties, then I'm free. If I'm free from marital troubles, then I'm free. If I'm free from personal issues with other people, then I'm free. Are you really? Have you ever really been free to yourself? Really? You'd like to think so, right? Do you own your house? Oh, you might buy it, buy it, but aren't you paying somebody? Oh, you say, well, I'm free and clear. Are you really? What do you pay on every year? Taxes. What's taxes? Means you're in bondage to somebody. In that aspect, you're in bondage to the government. We like to think we're free, but the truth is we're never really free to ourselves. We always have a master or ruler over us. In this world, when we're born into this world, we're born with a ruler hanging over us. The ruler is Satan. He's the ruler of this world. And when we live in the flesh, we make an agreement with him. He has influence over us. Even as Christians, if we live in the flesh, guess what? We give him permission to influence us. How? Because all we do is open the door for temptation. And he's the, he is the ruler of temptation. Do you know that? And so once we allow him to tempt us, then it's a movement of our flesh. 
But if we live in the Spirit, no temptation can overtake us. Woo, come on. If we live in the Spirit, we shall not be contained by laws. Why? Because we'll supernaturally look to fulfill it. So here's the point. Romans 6 says, whatever you put your body into, uh, or you, whatever you subject yourself to, shall become your master. Do you know that? So whatever you subject yourself to shall become your master. So if I subject myself to a lifestyle of sin, guess what's going to rule over me? Sin. And if I subject myself to being controlled by sin, then I'm giving the enemy access, and all he does is continue to feed that monkey. It's true. It's like giving yourself a banana. You know? Because all you're doing is feeding the problem when you submit yourself to a lifestyle of sin. Oh, but I'm free from it. Are you really? How many of you guys thought you were free to experience certain things, but after a period of time they had control, like alcohol or drugs? Huh? Oh, I was free. I got to experiment. And pretty soon it controlled you. How many of us thought we were free to eat that cheesecake? But after a while, man, that cheesecake began to control us began to put weight on us. We began to be in bondage to the food. And if you think I'm joking, just see me after I get done being at my mother-in-law's for a week. Because I gain weight every single time I go there. My wife says I have a choice. Do I really? Do I really have a choice when the food's that good? I subject myself to it. It rules over me. I can't wait for the next meal. Even though I'm stuffed, I'm still going to gorge myself. You see the problem? We're submitting to the wrong thing. It rules over us. How about this? We're submitting to earthly relationships first. Come on. And they're ruling and reigning over us, not God. So how, how does that work? We're looking to please the other person in order to find fulfillment. And so we're held hostage by the reaction. We're held hostage by the reaction of other people. We're held hostage by what other people think, what other people do, what other people hear. And what other people say, ooh. We're held hostage by what we see on the news, and it controls us and rules over us because we subject ourselves to it. And it rules. See, you've got to obey something. Something is going to rule over you. Either it's this world, the system, or it's God. You know why tithing is important? Because when you tithe, you recognize that it's God's anyways. The money doesn't rule over you. Financial problems don't rule over you, and now you're free to give, and now you're free to be appreciative of what God has given you. Oh, you see how this works? We are always going to be controlled or ruled over by something. And if I give God the control, then guess what? I get to experience this freedom and this blessed life within His control. It's true. It's really, really true. So I'm going to get to this next slide. You guys will like it. Christian freedom does not mean being free to do as we like. It means being free to do as we ought. Here's the case. Adam and Eve had everything they could have ever wanted. They had complete freedom underneath the rule of God. Once they began to move away from His commandments, they lost that freedom. Oh, They lost the freedom and the joy and the life, the, the meaningful life, once they started submitting to something else. Do you know that? What's the first thing they did? They made an agreement with the enemy. <coughs> when they made an agreement with the enemy, here's the point, they made a disagreement with God. The enemy rule ended up ruling and reigning over the whole situation, and guess what? They lost their freedom. Do you know that? They lost their freedom. Well, they lived a long time in the earth. What's the difference? They didn't have the joy. They didn't have God's presence. They were out there alone. They didn't get to see Him face to face any longer. They lost their freedom. Oh, man. This is deep. I mean, this goes back to the root, the heart of the pr problem. The problem is that we're b rebellious by nature, and when we're rebellious by nature, we think that we're rebelling so that we can be free. We're rebelling so we can be enslaved by the enemy. We're going to be enslaved by this world. Man, have we grown up in a backwards way. 
The enemy has twisted everything so bad that we think that we're actually free to live for ourselves. Are you kidding me? How many guys are controlled by what you see? Come on. I'm talking Christian. Yeah. You're controlled by what's in your bank account. I know. You use that. Watch this. Some people use that to define their freedom. Well, if I don't have enough money, I can't do. Oh, there it is. See, it's about perspective. And when you submit to the enemy, guess what? When you quit submitting to God and you submit to the enemy, that controls your perspective. It really does. So our freedom is to do God's will. Here's the freedom I have. If I'm doing God's will, I'm not doing mine. Let me say that again so I can have an impact. I think everybody's slow getting going this morning. If I do God's will, I'm free from mine. If I do God's will, then I'm free from this world. Bond sermon's correct. It's a willing slave. We willingly lay down our life because we know, watch this, we know the master that best suits us. A bond servant knows the best master. Oh, there it is. Mm, mm, this is good. A bond servant knows the best master and subjects himself to the one who's going to take care of them. Wow, now start looking at the things of the world versus the things of God and submitting your life to God's will. When you submit your life to God's will, willingly you're choosing that one that rules the best over you. There's the freedom, brothers and sisters. He rules over us, not with a rod of iron, but with His love. Oh, man. So then, so then, somebody hit me up with this, uh, this last week. Deuteronomy 8. Deuteronomy 8 is about them dwelling in the promised land. And they had everything they were going to desire as long as they served and worshipped God. As long as they submitted themselves to Him. They had freedom to enjoy it all. But when they quit submitting themselves to God, guess what? They began to be in bondage to those around them. Come on, I'm telling you something that's going to radically change your life. Because too many times we have put God on the shelf to do our own thing, thinking that we were free from ourselves and we actually just served the enemy and put ourselves into bondage. When we live in the ways of the world, we put ourselves into bondage. It says we become debtors. Now, when Christ came to set us free, he set us free to live in the Spirit, not in the flesh. Oh, what a beautiful picture. Is the law null and void? Not the Ten Commandments, the ceremonial law is. But the Ten Commandments are still there for a guidelines. You know why? Because the Ten Commandments there show us the works of the flesh. And so when we see the works of the flesh, we can be convicted to put that aside and live in the Spirit. And then the Galatians 5 says if we live in the Spirit, we're not subject to the law. You know why? Because when you live in the Spirit, you're by nature going to follow through with doing that which pleases God, which is far superior than not doing these other things. That's true. Plus, it's a higher call. Jesus said, hey, the law says you shall not commit adultery. Jesus said, you look a woman with the lust in your heart, you're already guilty. Some of you guys are guilty. Let's say, well, I don't look at another woman with lust in my heart. I don't look at another man with lust in my heart. Are you angry without a cause? Guilty. Guilty. So with my guilt, guess what? I'm defined under the law of having a problem. And God, there's consequences for my problem. But underneath the grace, it says Christ paid it all. So now I turn from the law and I say, Lord, I can't do that. I'm convicted. And I turn to grace and I get the power to say it's already been forgiven. So now I can start a new life in that freedom. This process goes through us all the time because we're living in the flesh naturally and we have the spirit supernaturally. And those two are in battle. You know, how many of you guys want to do something bad? Just because your flesh says, man, that looks good. Feel, it's going to feel good. And then you commit yourself to it and then you got this other side going, eh, eh. don't want to do that. But my flesh is trying to get me to do this because it's, it's like a TV commercial. It looks good. Drink Mountain Dew and it'll be best for you. My favorite Mountain Dew commercial is that guy's riding that great white, you know? That's me. I like that kind of stuff. Although I don't like sharks that much. But anyways, I want to commit to it. But the Holy Spirit's telling me no. And I got this battle going on. 
So I command myself to do bad things. There's consequences for my action. And then I not only do I suffer the consequence, I watch the bondage that grabs a hold of me. And here's the kicker. It doesn't just affect me. It affects all those around me. But if I live in the Spirit and I take heed to the things that God shows me, then I can walk in a manner that pleases God. Guess what? Not only does it keep me free, but it breaks the chains on other people. Oh, you want your freedom to grow? How many of you guys want your freedom to go? Your freedom in Christ to really grow exponentially? Start watching God break the chains of other people through you. Yeah, baby. So then you're watching this whole atmosphere getting stirred up where there's chain breakers everywhere and the glory of God is upon them and then no darkness shall come upon them and they are going out and setting people free. I mean, it's just this atmosphere of God. You know what I want in the church? This atmosphere of God where freedom exists. Not religious bondage. System of dues. We do this or do that. No, no. I get to please God. There's no rule against that. I get to come to his house and shout and praise. I get to be used to, to stir up other people to break their chains. This is the atmosphere that God intends for his church. But if the church doesn't realize it, you know what the church does? They walk in defeat trying to overcome the flesh by the flesh. You know how we do that in the church? We feel about our, better about ourselves when we put other people down. That's how it works. Come on. How many of you guys have been to churches where it's all about that? It's a superior place where everybody has them, some sort of knowledge where they're putting everybody else underneath their thumb who's not like them. Yeah, I'm demonstrative on, for a reason. Is that the church that Christ called together? Or did he call the church of the nobodies that have finally found somebody and became somebody glorious? And these people came from all directions of life and they had the opportunity not only to come in but to contribute and be who God intended them to be and they were free from the problems of this world. They were free, watch this, they were free over those descriptions and those words that were spoken to them as a child. You're not good. You're never going to be. Or you're going to be like your uncle so-and-so and uncle so-and-so is in jail. Some of the guys heard that. But you now when you're in Christ, guess what? You're free from all that. Man, can you imagine that? If the church actually realized that they're free? If people actually realize they're free? Oh, man. Temptation? Get behind me, Satan. Watch demons flee and tremble, man. It's kind of fun. I've actually seen it a couple times. You know why? They're not scared of me. They're scared of him. And when he shows up and he's in me, guess what? Great things happen. The Bible says this is how powerful the Holy Spirit is in you. It says that the same Spirit that rose Jesus Christ dwells in you. He will even raise your body from the dead. He'll raise your life. Wow! So I'm telling you, we have freedom. And this incredible freedom is amazing. We just don't realize it. Why? Because we're still caught up with the mind of the world. And in Romans 8, it says, that is against God. So we nearly need to renew our minds. Okay? Freedom comes at a price. That's why I shared with the kids what I shared. It's free for you, but it costs somebody. We're free from the law, but it costs him. We're freed from sin, and, and somebody needed to hear that. You're freed from sin, not freed to sin. He paid the price. Just like the veterans of our country paid the price so that we could have this freedom. And Memorial Day is a recognition of that price. Communion is a recognition of the price Christ paid. That's why he tells us to observe it. So that we would recognize what he had done. Just like we observe Memorial Day to recognize the freedom that we have because of the sacrifice of others. It's an incredible sacrifice for every veteran in here. I can't tell you enough. Thank you. And for those who couldn't be here because they lost their life either overseas or here in this, when they came home, we owe them an incredible amount of, amount of thanks. One of them is my own father. But the most glorious thing I've ever seen is when they came and they showed him honor in presenting colors at his funeral. I was so proud of that, I can't even tell you 
How much more should we be proud of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that brought us into this freedom that we have spiritually? It should be a life of gratitude. A life of thanksgiving. Not a life of, of doubt. Not a life of discouragement. Not this Eeyore Christianity. Well, it burdens mine. <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord. You know, that's like, I like to shout, Yeah! Watch these girls. Did you see those girls? They're like dancing with a joy, man. I almost started dancing with them, but then I got the look from my wife going. <laughs> <laughs> it's like me singing. God might bring you in, but if I'm left to myself, I might drive you out. But here's the point. God wants us to celebrate. This is why we call this celebration service. And even though sometimes in life we don't have no cause to celebrate, the declaration of God's Word and the performance that Christ paid on the cross gives us the opportunity to celebrate a life of freedom. Because sin shall not always rule and reign over us. What kind of perspective? That change in perspective is going to mean everything as you go forward in life. It'll mean everything. Got problems? Okay. That problem put, gets put in its place compared to God's glory that's eternal. Man, I'm telling you. And I'm, I really shouldn't be preaching this message this week because I, I didn't feel this message. I didn't even feel worthy to come in here this morning. You know, the subject of anger came up. Since we're on the subject, I'll tell you. Christ has made us free from being controlled by our own anger. And I want to be controlled by my own anger, and I didn't really want to come in here and talk to you about this this morning because I have to put my own anger in control in order to do this. If not, I become a hypocrite, and I don't like that. And it's so hard. Because when you get wronged, what do you want to do to somebody else? I want to hurt them just as bad. But then, in doing so, guess what that does for me? It puts me into bondage. The flesh. I can't please God in the flesh, can you? So then guess what? I need to put my will aside, take on His will, and now I can be free from me. Which means I'm free from you and free from them. <sighs> Father, I come before you and I just thank you that we have freedom in Jesus Christ and I pray whatever I'm going through that I submit it to you and I ask that those who have done me harm, that you would bless them instead. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry that I had to do that. Price, man. Price. What is... I'm going back on the same subject. I took it back. Lord, I gave it to you, but I'm going to take it back. You guys ever struggle with that? <laughs> True. Okay. Ha, ah, here it goes again. I realized that I was being mad and it, I was struggling with that. And then somebody called me just to check on me and see how I was doing. And I didn't want to answer the phone, but I answered the phone because you know what drives me crazier than having anger like that? It's being a hypocrite. I can't handle it. If somebody calls, I have to answer, or I call them right back. I just, I'm kind of weird. I'm wired weird. So they called. I talked to them. I thought, you know what? That was awfully nice that they called. I'm over here moping and whining to my own life, and to myself, and this person's willing to call and check on me. So I called them right back, and I said, yeah. whatever I had against somebody else, is nothing compared to the care that you showed me. I need to let it go. You see what freedom does? In letting it go, I can rejoice in the love that was shown me, not in the hate and discontent I had in my own heart for somebody else. So I'm moved by love, not by hate. I know this is deep stuff, but think how radical this stuff is when you let go. And you say, love is more important than hate. I'm letting it go. can't tell you. So then when I evaluate my life in all this circumstance, and I'm really frustrated, but you know what? When I looked at my life in all this circumstance, I can tell you why it's easier to let go. <sighs> because I don't know hardly anybody 
that's as loved as much as I am. By God and by you. And in comparison to that, what is anything? Nothing. What do you think should move my life? This or the problem? Talking about freedom. That is true freedom. That's true freedom. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, I can hear the hums and everything else. How many guys have ever watched Jay Vernon McGee? What's the song that they sing? Jay Vernon McGee. We're going on the bus. The Bible bus. Hey, I, I, I got a news for you. Jay Vernon McGee is very um, monotone come on the Bible bus. If you ever hear him preach, they have old messages and they play it on K-Wave on Sunday morning. Oh my goodness. He takes hellfire and brimstone up to a whole new level. I mean, that guy can scream and holler, let me tell you. You would never hear that when he's just teaching through the Bible bus. But when he's preaching, wow. But Jesus paid it all. And the song is so true. All to who him I owe. Our lives are not free to ourselves. We owe the freedom we have because of the price that was paid. So think about it, price. Price. Price would mean value, right? We, we think the, greater, the greater price you pay in a store for something, it means that it should have the greatest value. It doesn't always work that way in this world, right? Sometimes you pay the higher price and get messed up. It's like going through the drive through you know what's actually cheaper? I'm changing the subject. It's actually cheaper to go to Super China Buffet than it is to a fast food restaurant. <laughs> and you can go eat all you want there. I don't get it. <laughs> I told you, man, I'm motivated by food, you know? <laughs> hey, if you really want to find out where to go eat, ask a fat guy. They usually know. <laughs> <laughs> so, once again, let's drive it back into perspective. I'm going to get myself into trouble here. All right. Half off. Well, here, here's the thing. We describe value based on the price. Right? Based on the price that was paid. How would you describe the value paid to set you free? How would you describe the value of Christ? Could you put a monetary value to that? Could you put any temporal value to that? Priceless, amazing, the most valuable thing ever, right? Now I want you to look at yourself and say that I'm worth every penny. Huh. Huh. You're worth every penny that he paid. Because your value is not described in how you feel. Your value is not described in your past. Your value just is described on the cross. Wow then the, I should have a whole new lease on life, new understanding on life to live in that value. Now you understand what it means to live in a Christian identity, to live out his value in you. You remember Doubting Thomas? When he says, I won't believe unless I see what? The Bible describes scars. I see scars. It's the only thing I see permanent in Jesus' body. You know what the scars are? The receipt that says the payment has been paid in full. So now I can look at myself and say, thank you God that you've given me this incredible value that's always eternal and you don't ever see me anything less. Even if I don't see myself that way, you don't describe to me that I'm anything less than the price that you paid. If we could only grasp that church, we would never live a deficient life again. We would see our life completely free from this world, completely free from sin, and completely free just to serve and love God. Oh. Then I don't have to carry issues from my past. I don't have to look at other people the same. And I can just declare, <laughs> oh, I can just declare that there's freedom. There's liberty. 
Why do I want to be a Christian? Because the freedom that he provides. And it came at that cost. Living under the influence of the Holy Spirit produces an abundant life. That freedom come, came when we accepted Jesus and now the Holy Spirit influences our life. And now we can have the abundant life in following God and serving Him, not in serving sin. We're going to take away from the abundant life if we continue to squander it on sin. If you serve one, you can't serve the other. So when we serve sin, we're actually taken away from that abundant life that Christ has given us. We're, once again, putting ourselves in bondage. This is so powerful because if you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How many times have people pointed you back to your sinful lifestyle and say, take care of it? Wrong. Because even if you could take care of it with you, you would do it without Him, which means you're sinning by doing it in yourself. And then we're putting people back to the problem instead of putting them to the solution. You grow with God, guess what? You grow out of sin. Do you know that? We're trying to fix ourselves by ourselves. Does that work? We can only fix ourselves if we're following God and moving in the Spirit. And then we'll start cutting away the things of the flesh. I want believers, I'm going to say believers, not the church. I want believers to start pointing people to their Savior and pointing people to the solution and tell them to grow in that rather than tell them to take care of their sinful issues. Because I guarantee you what's going to change. If you start following God, your life will change. But if you try to take care of sin, you'll never change without Jesus. Without the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit is consuming. So now, the more I serve God, the more I grow in God, the more He grows in me. The less I want to sin, the less I'm controlled by this world. The more I'm free. The more I'm free. This is radical. This is so radical because without that, you know what we have? We can have a place where people exist to try to change themselves with themselves. You know what we call that? Religion. But I want a place where people can come in. It's not even about them. It's about the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ and watch them change. Don't you want to be free from this world? How many guys are consumed by your own thoughts that keep getting stimulated by this world, the news, and all the garbage around you? Yeah? Let me share. It looks like this. It doesn't look like this because I'll share why. It looks like this. The children of Israel did this for 40 years. They wandered around in a circle. Instead of a circle, let's call it what it is, a cycle. Watch this. The death cycle is continually stirred up by the same issues over and over and over again with no solution. We say that is insanity. Watch this. The Spirit of God works like this. What's the difference? Because if you took a side view, you'll see even though you're in the same place, you're at a different level because it's a spiral upwards and watch your life change. That's how God works. And here's the thing, when you submit to the Spirit, He becomes more, which means you become less, which means that you're free from the things of this world. Isaiah was so consumed by the Lord, he says, he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and in that God became everything. Isaiah became nothing. Oh, that seems harsh. Watch this. As God became everything, Isaiah's problems became nothing. Isaiah's issues became nothing. And so that his life was consumed by making God everything. So he wasn't controlled by anything other than God. That's the freedom. That's why worship's so powerful. I can go in that place and make God everything. Guess what? All my junk can't go in with me. Woo! I don't have to worry about what this world's doing because I got a hope of a new one. Let it come. Look at the freedom we have in Christ. Look at the freedom we have in Christ. That's awesome. Live in freedom. Be controlled by the Holy Spirit, not the flesh. The Holy Spirit influences me. He gives me ideas and understanding. And, and it's almost like a voice with thought. I don't necessarily hear the voice as much as I hear the thought. Kevin, this is God. No, nah. <laughs> It's really like, hey, knucklehead. Hey, get this. You don't understand it now, but maybe you will. But he influences my life so that, guess what? 
the Bible goes with me everywhere and the principles that it teaches goes with me everywhere and I'm free just to live in God. I don't have to wait for it. <coughs> that keeps me away from sin. My daughter asked my mom one time, or my mom, asked my wife sometime. Big difference. Uh, how come dad's always uh, serving in church? And she said something very powerful to her. She goes, do you know where your dad would probably be if he wasn't? Freedom. I wouldn't be free to be this person you see here today if I wasn't serving God. I wouldn't be free in my own where we used to live. That's why God moved us out here to California. I couldn't, I wasn't free there to become who God wanted me to be because I had too many things of the world holding on to me. <coughs> had we stayed in that environment, we would have not been free. We would have been stuck in bondage. Probably given over to a sinful lifestyle of the flesh. And then the results of that, divorce, probably other things. But the freedom that Christ has given us is not only freedom for us, it's freedom for you. Amen. Oh, I love this one. You guys are going to like this. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is death. This is what it's like following the flesh. It seems right. We grew up this way, seeming everything was right, right? Only to discover that at the end it brought death. How many of you guys ever lived this verse? How many of you guys live this verse on a daily basis? That Reese's seems right. It ain't going to make me fat. Ooh, that gossip <laughs> sounds good. It's not going to get me in trouble. Come on. And we grow up <coughs> in a way that seems right. And the way that seems right is that we're free to ourselves. And so we're going to rebel against everything. That seems right, doesn't it? Todd. Anarchist. He knows, he knows, Steve, anarchist. It seems right that we can rebel against all authority and be right. So we're going to rebel against this and we're going to rebel against that. Some women really rebel. But freedom doesn't come in rebellion. It comes in submission. Did I say that right? Freedom doesn't come in rebellion. It comes in submission. See, the opposite, the opposite is true. Hey, guess what? It seems right to put somebody else down. It does, doesn't it? It seems right to put other people down. How many of you guys feel that way? It seems right. It feels easy. It feels good to put other people down. But the opposite is true. Watch this. There's a way that doesn't seem right to a man, but the end is life. And here's where I'm going to go. It doesn't seem right to submit to God. It doesn't seem right to pray. It doesn't seem right just to read your Bible. Yet, out of that, God produces amazing results of life. Been to U-Turn. And uh, one guy that was at U-Turn shared this with me. He goes, all we did was work and read the Bible. It didn't seem right to him. It didn't seem like it was going to get him anywhere. He didn't even have counseling. He's like, what's this going to do for me? Guess what? After he got out of it, it completely changed his mind, which completely changed his action, which gave him support that he's always lacked. It didn't seem right to him, but it brought life. When we live in the... <coughs> Last time we went to U-Turn, I gave an altar call. There's probably 60 people there. I couldn't tell you how many but I'd say 15 to, 13, 15 to 30 stood up to receive the Lord. You know why? Because they recognized that the way that seemed right brought death. But there's a new way. And the way that doesn't seem right can bring life. And that is the Spirit. It's not natural for us to live in the Spirit because it goes in opposition to the things that we grew up with. It goes up. <coughs> The natural man says, get all you can get. The spiritual man says, give all you can give. That's not natural. 
The natural man says you hate your enemy. The spiritual man says you love and pray for them. It's not natural. It doesn't seem right. But the end, it produces life. So now that we're talking about living the Spirit, let me take it up another notch. When you live in the Spirit, you don't have to fear judgment. So that now, I don't fear judgment. Now I can admit that I've been wrong to other people. You know what that does? It frees me up from carrying the burden. And I can simply say, I'm sorry and start over because the cross says that I can admit it because it's been taken out of the way and now there's freedom. So many of us are carrying burdens around that we were never meant to carry because we don't realize that Christ paid the price so that we could become something else and by the Spirit of God we don't have to fear judgment. We can lay it down at the feet of Jesus and we don't have to pick it back up again. That problem doesn't have to become us because some people have lived their whole life based on a problem. They define their life on that problem. Druggy, drunk, overweight, ungrateful. And we've defined our life by that. But the freedom that we have in Christ says that we live in the Spirit, we can actually set it aside and we can become new. Grace allows us to serve God, not out of obligation, but out of appreciation. And now I'm a new person. I don't have to fix the old one. Let him die. I can come up a new man. I don't even have to live in the same way. That's what this freedom does. This freedom, watch this. This freedom gives me the opportunity to give love even if I don't receive it back. So I can't be manipulated by other people or their emotions. This freedom allows me just to give it all away if I need to because it's not mine in the first place. I can't be controlled by it. Ready? Are you ready to give up your family and give it to God so that you don't have to be controlled by them or manipulated by them any longer? Oh, how many guys? Just raise your hand. Don't be scared, scared if this is you right now. Your family is holding you back and you can give them up to God because you know that they're in His hands. You can just be free to live for Christ. You don't have to get them fixed. You know? People aren't like dogs. You don't have to get them fixed. They're not like that. You know what they are? They're God's problem, not ours. Think of the freedom that is. Lord, I'm turning them loose. So can I tell you a story to close this with? He's not here, so I can pick on him. I know a man who's, I've shared this before, but this is just such a powerful story. I know a man who was consumed by drugs, went to the corner of 371 and 79, and it was back when it used to be the pullout, and there was a yield sign there. Pulled to the stop of the side of the road, shook his fists at God, and said, "You better take this from me." Drives his house down the road and gets pulled over by the cops. He did a year. So he gets out. He discovers something that his mom at the very same time went to God and said, he's no longer mine. God, I'm tired. I can't fix him anymore. I give him to you. And the very same time she gave him over to the Lord is the same time that he got pulled over and God freed him from the drugs. Oh, it gets better. So, um, probably three years later, we ended up praying over somebody that was um, addicted to pain pills. And usually when you get off pain pills, there's a stomach issue that goes on. And it's very painful. So he came forward, admitted it, admitted it. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit was working. He didn't have to fear judgment. We laid hands on him, prayed over him. God took the addiction away overnight when we prayed over him. So we're praying, playing this song, In the Eye of the Storm. And at the very last verse, it says, When addiction steals my baby girl and I, there's nothing else to do, my only hope is in you. So I'm sharing this story with the kids. Just sharing this story with the kids. Because I'm thinking, oh man, this ties right into the song. As I'm sharing the story with those kids, I realized that one of the kids was the son of that man that we were praying over that got healed of the drug addiction overnight. 
And it was a direct result of God taking away the drug problem of that man. You see how the Spirit of God moves? And not only are they dwelling free, that kid's dwelling free because of the work of the Holy Spirit. Freedom. So we have this choice. Am I going to live in the freedom by which Christ has made me free? Or am I going to again entangle myself to bondage? In the words of Mel Gibson, I choose freedom. Freedom! You know why? Because I'm tired of being in bondage. Tired of being in bondage to my emotions. Tired of being in bondage to, to other people. Tired of being in bondage to this world. I'm tired of worrying about tomorrow. How many of you guys are tired of worrying about tomorrow? Come on. You know what this message says? I don't have to worry. I can give it in the hands of God Almighty. I can choose Him. I can live in that freedom. I can live in that power. And I can become more without being controlled. That's freedom. Worship is freedom because no longer are these concerns walking in my mind. Because I'm walking in the Spirit. That's powerful. If I can have our ushers come forward, we're going to take up our tithe. You know what? I'm going to share with you guys why we take up our tithe. I'm going to share with you guys. Well, I'll share afterwards. So let's pray. Father, we come before you. We bless you and praise you for this offering. We pray that it would bring you much glory and praise and that you would just be honored. Uh, thank you, Lord, that you're going to provide something better for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I want to share something with you guys. You'll probably have to turn up because I don't think you run through the system. So that'd be fine. Here's the thing I want to share with you. If we look at this situation with our church, we would say, oh man, we're not really free. But if we look from the situation of this church, maybe we were truly free and not controlled by that building at the moment. That's right. Bigger building. Bill bigger building, Amen. Do you know this? I, I firmly believe this. Our presence here in this community hall is not only a blessing to us, but I think our presence here is keeping other things out. I believe that we're keeping other false religions out of using this hall on a Sunday. I believe that. I believe that people are coming in through this door that might not come through a church. I believe that people come in here in bondage and they're so controlled by their hurt and their pain that they don't see a way of escape and they can hear a message on freedom today and their lives could radically change forever. I believe that because that's what God's words declares. That's the value that Christ gave us at the cross. You know, we had a gentleman come in here, one of our churchgoers, so much in pain he can't even move. You know why he came in church this morning? So that his brothers would lay hands on him and declare God's word and God's freedom over him and not over the pain. I mentioned we have a gentleman that's dying. And yet, if you looked at it in the flesh, you would say, oh man, this is a horrible situation. But if you look at it in the spirit, you're going, I can't wait till he gets out of here. Wow, what freedom there is in that. What freedom there is to know that your loved ones with Jesus are waiting for you. <laughs> that death isn't the end. What freedom is there to know that no matter what's in my body, it doesn't define where I'm going. Whether it's cancer, whether it's brokenness in my own body doesn't define what God has for me. And where's the church that should be preaching this freedom out into a world of darkness? The church hasn't recognized what Jesus has saved them from. And once we realize that, we're not going to let those moments go to waste. Because our freedom is not for me. It's for Him. When I see Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you for everything you've given me. I surrender. That's the freedom He declares. So if I can have our worship team come forward. We're going to close in worship. Please stay and help.